Cities After is a bi-monthly podcast about the future of cities. Grounded in our daily urban struggles, it is part dystopian and part utopian. My intention is to entice your civic imagination into action, because we know that a more just and sustainable urban future is possible. This is Miguel Robles Duran, and I dare you to imagine our cities after. COVID, COVID. global warming, Extract. gentrification, Extract. homelessness, racism, colonialism, patriarchy, hunger, police brutality, capitalism, capitalism. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. In this podcast, my attempt is to revise and follow on the urbanization of shock therapy, a topic that I first wrote about in 2011 for a book that I co-authored and co-edited with Tal Kaminer and Heidi Son, titled Urban Asymmetries, Studies and Projects on Neoliberal Urbanization. I later expanded on it in an essay I wrote for the 2014 edition of the Tirana Contemporary Art Biennial. And now, 10 years after I first wrote on the topic, I find it more relevant than ever, especially as the shock of the pandemic becomes normalized and absorbed by capitalist forces. I believe that looking at the evolution of the urbanization of shock therapy might allow us to foresee the coming urban transformations and thus be more prepared and organized to resist and counteract them. To begin, I feel it is imperative that I dedicate a good portion of this podcast to give a short historical overview of early neoliberalism and its urban impacts. So I ask you to please bear with me, as I most certainly will fail to summarize the last 42 years in a few minutes. But I will try. This will offer a good basis for all of us to continue discussing this topic in the episodes ahead, where I will look more in depth into Latin America's recent privatization wave and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals push for more public-private partnerships in urban development after the pandemic. Since 1979's shocking consolidation of neoliberalism as a new economic orthodoxy, regulating public policy and therefore urbanization in the advanced capitalist world, two very distinct general forms of urbanization dominated social spatial development in almost every major city of the globe. Strategies of interurban competition, surplus absorption, and polycentral concentration have been the driving force behind the development agenda of most developed cities around the globe. Whereas in the so-called third world, with the illusionary desire to join the standards of the developed world, the urban development strategies have been subject, on one hand, to the mimicking of those considered advanced cities, and on the other, to the economic imposition of the international neoliberal regulatory bodies, whose main urban interests have always been the creation of a safe and open environment for foreign direct investment and the stimulation of an ideal business terrain that advances capitalist accumulation, of course, for the elites of the developed world. In the book A Brief History of Neoliberalism by David Harvey, he argues that this ideology, and I start the quote, proposes that human well-being can be best advanced by liberating individual entrepreneurial freedoms and skills within an institutional framework characterized by strong private property rights, free markets, and free trade, I end quote. If so, then it was clear from the very beginning that only those cities or countries with developed economies and consolidated institutional frameworks would be able to successfully advance as power centers for capitalist accumulation, and in turn, absorb the surplus generated by the exploitation of the weak, underdeveloped, and emerging cities and their populations. Neoliberal capital made instrumental to its expansive growth the fragmented forms of urbanization of the third world, so much that it has become almost impossible to conceive any form of third world urbanization that doesn't submit to the aggressive ways and wants 
of the neoliberal agenda. The might of the neoliberal regime did not only expand by forced acquisition and military oppression of captured territories, as many colonial powers did beforehand. Instead, during its 42 years of domination, the global success of the neoliberal regime has been characterized by a violent and splintered penetration of economic reforms into any existing urban order or disorder. After all, in the early 1970s, the influential political scientist and foreign policy advisor Samuel Huntington was already arguing that expanding American interests through economic penetration was in fact a mode of domination that was highly compatible with the multiplication of national sovereignties in the third world. Indeed, the multiplication of sovereignties of the last four decades did not only facilitate the growth of multinational markets, but more importantly, it opened new territories to foreign direct investment and created vast fertile regions for surplus accumulation. What characterized these fertile regions before their penetration by neoliberal forces was that they all had a vulnerable economy and in most cases a manifest social-political instability and if they didn't, why not create one? This brings me back to the Republic of Chile in 1973 where the success of the U.S.-backed military coup against the democratically elected socialist government of Salvador Allende induced a climate of social political instability and with it a deep economic crisis. This induced shock gave Nixon's foreign policy a perfect opportunity to experiment with the implementation of many of the economic plans that ended up being common practice in the global neoliberal turn. In the first years of the Chile experiment, the focus became the exertion of radical economic policy and its shifts towards the privatization of everything existing. And to Nixon's luck, these shifts were to be enforced by the military tyranny of the Pinochet regime. However, no real attention was paid to urbanization or territorial changes until 1979. Coincidentally, the same year that Margaret Thatcher became the Prime Minister of the UK, becoming America's most important ally in the experimentation and forceful implementation of neoliberal policies in Chile. This year, an amendment was made to the General Urban Plan of Santiago, the capital city, which proposed a large territorial extension that was to offer an open laboratory for probing one of the most important neoliberal prescriptions, the privatization of space, cities, and their everyday life. In this general urban plan, state property was offered to the open market and private concessions to the building and management of public spaces and urban infrastructure were also sold. In a few years, most subsidized rental housing was converted to subsidized private housing. Schools, hospitals, and many public buildings were also offered to the market, along with the state's construction industry, its parks, transit infrastructure, utilities, urban management, and services were given to private concession. In short, the production of the city that was once the responsibility of a democratic social state and its welfare was now at the wheel of a US-UK supported fascist dictatorship that supported the elite private developers, real estate speculators, private banking, and wealthy international investors. The special repercussions of such economic transformations were immense and quite possibly never predicted by Friedrich von Hayek and his clan of trailblazing neoliberal theorists from the Chicago School. Let me summarize in six general points what I think were the major urban consequences of the orchestrated economic shock. First, the expansion of informal settlements, mostly in the peripheries, adding to the ones formed as consequence of Chile's period of industrialization. Second, 
the forced displacement of poor dwellers from central areas of the city towards housing settlements in the periphery, causing the multiplication of affordable housing districts and the enclosing of middle high-class residential areas. Third, the creation of what I call green zones, a term inspired by the new American war terminology, which are urban islands that were protected and considered safe for direct foreign investment and international tourism. Fourth, the building of central business districts or CBDs designed to concentrate in a type of green zone the administrative, commercial, and financial operations of fresh capital injections that came from the privatization. Fifth, the introduction of polycentrality as the main planning concept of the city. The making of central business districts and green zones already followed such conception. And sixth, the expansion of the main streets and avenues of the polycenter network and the construction of new roads to reinforce the importance of the newly determined centralities. This goes together with the infrastructural and technological investment necessary to support such urban regeneration, which of course was privately financed. These points exemplify, to my view, the most extreme urban territorial transformations produced by neoliberalism and by no means cover the total impact of the shock therapy. Similar points can be made in regards to the environmental disasters produced by the imposition of such rapid changes, the social ache brought by the dissolution of collective relations and economic exchange forms, and the radical alterations of daily life patterns along with the mental conceptions about the city. It is also important to note that the urban processes under industrialization and the functionalist planning that normally came with it had already produced deep class divisions in Santiago. Capital spatial concentration, informal settlements, and large infrastructural transformations. Neoliberal urbanization just multiplied these effects and introduced new and better forms of economic penetration. Neoliberal urbanization at that point heralded the total social deconcentration of alienated dwellers and workers by a way of the indeterminate scattering of the means of production and their dependence into the outskirts, voids, and peripheries of the city. While the 19th century showed the formation of peripheral concentrations of labor space and housing in determinate spaces inside or outside the city, the late 20th and early 21st century examples and its correlated urban theories would show us the splintering of the fragments and the submission of their economic autonomy to the urban centers of capital accumulation. Neoliberal urbanism brought a radical division in the civic appropriation of the urban fabric and ultimately bringing the worldwide pronounced confidence on the idea of the polycentric city, defining the proliferation of protected urban centralities as the main operative principle of this kind of urbanization. Learning not only from Chile, but also from other third world nations that during the 1980s, under the influence of course of the economic shock therapy, went through similar abrupt process of urbanization one cannot help to observe how perfected the methodological frameworks of shock therapy had become. After many successful early neoliberal experiments with Santiago and other cities in Chile, it did not take long for Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan to start implementing some of the well-functioning privatization policies in their respective homelands, the UK and the United States. For example, the British urban theorist and historian Peter Hall referred to the decade of the 1980s as an era that supported an inverted idea of conventional planning, as it was known. And I quote, 
the use of plans and regulations to guide the use of land seemed more and more discredited. Instead, planning turned from regulating urban growth to encouraging it by any and every possible means." End of quote. The UK in the 1980s was indeed characterized by a dramatic increase of urban revitalizations and the development of new urban spaces. Large-scale large -scale projects such as the London Docklands, which capitalized on the newly introduced provision for enterprise zones. In part, modeled after the ongoing green zone experiments in Santiago. Just during 1980 and 1981, 15 enterprise zones were designated in the UK. These zones were a pioneering urban status or denomination which exempted businesses in the zone from property taxes, as well as offered many other investment incentives, some including 100% of capital allowances that together with rates of exemptions amounted to a treasury subsidy at that time of more than 150 million pounds. 1985 was the year when Financier Credit Suisse, the first Boston man bank and Morgan Stanley formed an international consortium to promote the development of the ambitious Canary Wharf in the Docklands, London. I want to stress here that this was a completely new way of urbanizing. What was once planned and produced by the state and its public workforce was now being designed in the closed boardrooms of the capitalist elites and financed by private banks, international investors, and corporate conglomerates. This was happening while public investments were being defunded in cities around the world. This transformative trend, together with the strategic promotion and development of other enterprise zones and business districts across the UK, West Germany, France, Canada, and the United States, Japan, Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia, and many other territories with advanced capitalist economies, emerged as a concrete and symbolic materialization of the new politics of deregulation, financialization, and privatization of the neoliberal growth machine that rapidly took over most of the Western dominated world. In short, the radical pro-growth policies of the 1980s demanded an extreme financial productivity of urban space. And for this, it became dogma to subsume the use value of public goods to private investors and developers for the maximization of surplus accumulation and the good health of the deregulated financial circuit that they were creating. The 1980s had laid the development foundations for all the cities we inhabit. But as I mentioned before, this was happening under two very distinct modalities. The wealthy countries were planning urban policy centers that permitted capital absorption and concentration, while the so-called third world countries were forced to develop urban spaces that aided capital extraction, green zones, to continue using that military metaphor. Thanks to American coercion and induced economic shocks, Latin America became the green zone development capital of that decade. The shock therapy continued reaping profits and its supply theories were evolving rapidly around the globe. In the 1990s, an even more aggressive form of neoliberal penetration was forced upon the vulnerable Eastern European cities after the collapse of the Soviet regime in 1989. The opening of Eastern European nations prompted neoliberal academics to take all historical defeats and successes of the neoliberal economic penetration of Latin America and begin to assemble a more precise and scientific theory that could guide the economic and political conversion of communist or socialist regimes into contemporary capitalist states. Early traces of such theory were first published by the American economist Jeffrey Sachs in January 1990 
under the title, What is to be done? A form of sarcastic inversion to the once highly influential communist text written by Vladimir Lenin. Sack's article dealt with the manner in which neoliberalism should seek to penetrate and triumph in the unstable region. This article, along with other influential texts and lectures he made during that year, were received by the American government and many academics as containing the most incisive prescriptions for dealing with such incredible task. Crediting Sachs with the founding of a new discipline. It was called the economic theory of the transition, later to be known as the theory of economic shock therapy. I should denote that according to John Lloyd, a neoliberal economist very close to Sachs, the shock therapy program was precisely designed to be applied in non-democratic states. In his words, I quote, no democratic electorate would tolerate for half a year. Yet, if it fails, there will be no democracy, end of quote. The theory traces objectives on the totality of the post-communist region and not on the specifics of different states that composed it. Obviously, leaving the problem of urbanization out of the urgent conversion equation. One might have expected that the teachings of past Latin American and Asian transitions could have prompted the economists and the politicians of the disastrous urban effects, social losses, and disruptions generated by the consequential rapid migration, territorial destabilization, and the alterations of property rights. After 11 years of shocks, it was clearer that the neoliberal penetration was neither about civic rights nor about the betterment of the overall living conditions. As Sachs once claimed, and I quote, a recovery of human freedom and democratically based rights of living standards. End of quote. For its patrons, neoliberalism in the third world was about economic domination and never about building an environment for a civic society. In the words of the economist Peter Gowan, I quote, the supporters of shock therapy turned the idea of building a civil society in the East into simple notions of ending state interference, state funding, state control. Society, it seems, would be civil only if there was no political interference. The respect for popular sovereignty, the building of links between public policy and voter preferences, or responding positively to expressions of public protest or strike action by desperate employees, formed no part of this program. Strong public protests against these kinds of privatization that were favoring the West or against increasingly unpopular examples of predatory Western buyouts were to be ignored. I end of quote. So this was the fate of Eastern European cities. These cities became a territory for predatory investment and economic exploitation like Latin America. As long as there was some kind of formal structure to enforce private property, secure foreign investment, and to make daily life better in a few green zones, the other present forms of urbanization, such as the extreme growth of informal dwellings and slums, or the ongoing illegal territorial repartitions, or the chaotic practices of the building industries, were often disregarded as unimportant casualties of the shock process. Neglecting its urban and social dimension and following on the Latin American experiments, any Eastern European nation wishing to restructure and join the international capitalist markets would have to follow and accomplish the following six points. First, opening the city to international trade. The building of key urban infrastructure for its support was prioritized focusing investment into trade highways and entry ports than to the inner fabric of the cities. Second, private ownership had to be the main engine of urban growth. 
leaving any form of social or public regulation inoperative. Consequently, the city became a wild, wild west environment open to any form of speculation and trade. Third, corporate ownership as the dominant organizational form for large enterprises. Urban priority was given for the construction of headquarters and foreign corporate branches, mostly in green zones. Fourth, obligatory openness to foreign direct investment with little or no anti-dumping regulation. This meant that any previously established associations or businesses would now be at the mercy of the ravishing market forces of the West. Fifth, urban finances and large development credits to be regulated by key international economic institutions such as the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, or IMF. These forms of debt control made sure that the mediation of all future urban development would be at the hands of foreign interests. And sixth, the obligatory import of key development technologies, consultancies, managerial talent, and organizational patterns, so to guarantee that the application of the development priorities went unobstructed. Any Eastern European nation that would conform to the previous points would unquestionably see similar drastic urban transformations as the ones experimented by Latin American cities such as Santiago de Chile, Quito, Bogotá, Tijuana, Lima, or Buenos Aires, as well as the similar weakening of social power, the end of state help or intervention, massive unemployment, and the sudden drop of living standards. In contradiction to the historical indicators, Sachs was convinced that the follow-through of these restructuring points would help Eastern European nations, and I quote him, rejoin the rest of the global economy by importing some prosperity from the rest of the world, and I end his quote. But as Gowan rightly pointed out, the restructuring was not to be fully internal in a democratic decision. The restructuring was to be left to the market signals and market forces, and especially to Western market forces, entering through foreign direct investment, as the governments lacked the financial resources to buy large enterprises. The task of target governments was limited to depress wages, to impose hard budget constraints upon enterprises, and to privatize for cash. Market signals and forces, according to Jeffrey Sachs, will do the rest. Public sector interventionism was certainly necessary, but it took the form of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, exerting necessary leverage to ensure that these points were followed and making sure also that any restructuring of state-owned enterprises was blocked before their privatization. So three decades have passed since the first transitional shocks of the Eastern European economic shock therapy. By now, Varso, Bucharest, Zagreb, Tirana, and Belgrade, to name a few, have surrendered control of their growth to private market forces, foreign direct investments, foreign credits, foreign institutions, and to the trade economy of foreign products. As an effect of all these changes and due to promoted speculation, land privatization and spatial capital concentration, the territorial organization of these cities has spurred out of control, and in many cases it has generated social and environmental havoc. Social relations in these cities are almost unrecognizable to what they were during the autocratic repression 20 years ago. Now, foreign commodities, broad class differentiations from ultra poor to ultra rich, predatory competition, and European Union aspirations mediate all social relations. From a personified dictatorship to a market dictatorship, this was the fate of Eastern Europe 
in many ways similar as it was for Latin America a decade before. And as expected, by the early 2000s, the rest of the world had followed suit. As neoliberal capital moved through the new millennium, the shocking positions of supranational institutions, backed by the US, the European Union, and other wealthy countries, was simply put, naturalized. The exchange of debt relief for new forms of debt demanded more privatizations, more financial deregulation, more public-private partnerships, more fiscal subsidies, and further weakening of labor and environmental protections. This is what contemporary capitalism de facto prescribes for development around the globe. And despite the many forms of resistance and opposition that left-leaning governments had during the first decade of the 2000s, such as the attempts of Ecuador, Bolivia, Venezuela, and Brazil to counter neoliberal policy with pro-social measures and a bit of demagogy, the options they had at the end seemed to be either more poverty and isolation through resistance or more economic development through liberalization. Out of the many neoliberal inventions, Perhaps the urban development prescription that got more ingrained through four decades of continuous shock therapy was the figure of the public-private partnership, although I prefer to call it in reverse as a private-public partnership. This alliance has been universally promoted by the United Nations, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the European Union, top universities, commercial banks, developers, consultancy firms, as the solution to meet the development needs of governments at all scales. If one takes a closer look at the multitude of development measures taken by cities around the globe, the creation of private-public partnerships is a constant. Whether it's for the building of new infrastructure, or new public spaces, or affordable housing, the private corporation is always there, ready to use the public for subsidizing and supporting their profit maximization. To put the impact of private-public partnership in perspective, in Latin America alone, private investment in urban infrastructure, according to the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean of the World Bank, Average 40% of all projects developed in the 35 years between 1980 and 2015. Overall, the private-public partnership dominance remained unchallenged until the end of 2019, when the pandemic paralyzed development as usual. COVID-19 gave a different kind of economic shock, this time affecting, at least at the beginning, both the private and the public side of partnerships responsible for many urban and territorial development projects around the globe. The situation was so dire that even some academics speculated that this global catastrophe would be the event that finally ended neoliberal supremacy. Governments around the world scrambled to provide widespread social aid but this time without much support of foreign direct investment. In January of this year, a person named Helga van Pier, a Belgian lawyer and expert advisor on private-public partnerships for the World Bank, posted in the official blog of the Infrastructure, Finance, Public-Private Partnerships and Guarantees Group of the World Bank the following questions. She asked, what is the impact of the pandemic on upcoming and ongoing public-private partnership tenders? Will the public sector launch more infrastructure projects to support the economy? Or will it redirect resources from infrastructure to health and social sectors? Will the pandemic help optimize award procedures 
Is the private sector more eager to participate in tender processes that may result in winning a long-term public-private partnership with a reliable government counterparty? Or will companies shy away from participation in uncertain times? In the following months of the year, many of her questions began to get a clear answer. As Winston Churchill said, never let a good crisis go to waste. The supranational neoliberal bodies and the finance sectors were hard at work to reorient the pandemic into an opportunity for more growth. This time, they appear to be coinciding to embody private surplus accumulation in what they call a sustainable, green, and resilient form. The World Bank is now promoting bouncing forward to build infrastructure resilience. According to them, I quote, this crisis presents a unique opportunity for private and public sectors to collaborate to move forward green and climate resilient investments to provide jobs and economic stimulus in the medium term, while also providing long-term gains. End of quote. This is exactly where neoliberalism and the sustainable development goals of the United Nations cross paths. According to the World Bank, and I quote, in response to the pandemic, multilateral development banks, development financial institutions, national governments, and other stakeholders must recognize the need to mobilize more private capital for infrastructure development. This is especially as countries look at this sector to stimulate their economies." End of quote. In short, the private finance world is putting their hands all over the trillions on infrastructure stimuli that most countries will put forward to ease the economic strains of the pandemic. In the words of Jérôme Jean Hegeli, the group chief economist of Swiss Re, which is the world's largest reinsurer. I quote him, once the acute phase of this crisis is over, we will know that many governments will turn to infrastructure spending as an economic stimulus to create jobs and stimulate productive investment, end of quote. Swiss Re is also proposing to move private-public partnerships forward with the creation of green stimulus packages, which according to them will be crucial to jumpstart stagnant economic activity, while of course contribute to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Swiss Re is also calling all multilateral development banks, development financial institutions, national governments to mobilize private investment into infrastructure. According to their estimates, Institutional investors, such as pension funds, credit unions, and commercial banks, have around 80 to $85 trillion available for infrastructure financing. And this is while the global infrastructure financing gap is along the lines of $66 trillion. Two-thirds, or $44 trillion, of this gap is in development countries where most certainly domestic long-term financing remains rare, and according to them, where the most of the profit-making opportunities for foreign investors lie. This is where they argue that the promotion of a well-structured, well-balanced public-private partnership that are attractive to private capital and fiscally responsible are more important than ever. Swiss Re and the World Bank are certainly not the only institutions that are promoting the next neoliberal shock in what they call green infrastructure development and a circular economy. The European Union, the International Monetary Fund, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the Inter-American Development Bank, the United Nations, and many others are already orchestrating it. 
My concluding question to you is, if sustainability, resilience, and green development now fully mask post-pandemic neoliberal capital, how will we resist and counteract it and do it without affecting many important political measures needed to mitigate climate change? My goal is to delve into possible answers in the coming episodes. This was another episode of Cities After. Thank you for listening and don't forget to subscribe.